Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started in just a second. I know some more people are going to be joining us. Great, thank you. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anne O'Leary. I'm here at UC Berkeley School of Law um, at the newly configured Warren Institute with a project on the um, center, previously called the Center on Health, Economic, and Family Security. Um, we're really delighted to be co-sponsoring this event with Netsi Firestein and her group from the Labor, Labor Project for Working Families. They are a group that has been long working on California paid family leave, um, where they were instrumental in helping pass the bill here in the state and continue to be instrumental in terms of its implementation and in um, continued uh, legislative strategy. And we'll hear from them a little bit uh, towards the end of the program. But we're gathered here today because we have an amazing team of academics um, who have come together. And particularly, um, we have uh, two who have traveled from the East Coast. Um, Ruth Milkman, uh, here to my left, and Eileen Applebaum. Ruth, um, for a long time, was with uh, UCLA for, I think, about 20 years. Is that right? 21. 21. <laughs> and now is at the City University of New York, where she is a professor of sociology and the associate director of the Joseph Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. Um, Ruth is not only an expert in paid family leave, but does a whole range of issues regarding the sociology of workers, and particularly um, issues related to gender and also to uh, immigrant workers. So we're delighted that she's here. I'll tell you a bit more about her study in a second. Eileen Applebaum um, also recently moved institutions. She was with the Rutgers uh, Institute for a long time, um, Institute on Women. Uh, now I'm going to get the name wrong. Women. Center for Women and Work. Center for Women and Work. I, I memorized the really long one from Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Center, for, <laughs> Center for Women and Work. And she is now with the, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Um, together, the two of them bring um, decades of experience working on, as I said, not just uh, these gender issues, but also the institutions of work um, and um, uh, labor market issues. And so we're really delighted to have both of them here. And then we have our homegrown team, uh, which we're also delighted to have here. Uh, professor Catherine Albiston is a professor here at the law school. Uh, for a long time, she has worked on a, a range of issues, but most recently, KT, hold up your book, please. Uh, most recently published a book um, which is on uh, what we call, which, what she would call rights on leave. Um, it's about institutional inequities in terms of workers who um, have access or don't have access to leave rights and whether they uh, take up those rights, and she'll talk more about that. And then we have Professor Sylvia Gundelman, who is with our School of Public Health here in Berkeley and also is an expert in family leave, where she looks at the, um, the intersection between public health and family leave. What are the public health impacts of family leave? So the way we're going to conduct this um, day is first, Ruth and Eileen are, are really the, our centerpiece because they have recently come out with a study that they'll talk to you about called Leaves That Pay. And it's a follow-up study from the very beginning of the implementation of the California Paid Family Leave Act. We've been incredibly uh, lucky that Ruth and Eileen were on the ground level doing, making sure to do research from the very beginning about the implementation of paid family leave in California. They did an initial study and then they had been interested in doing a five-year follow-up. This is the five-year follow-up. I think it came in year six, but it was uh, pretty close. <laughs> close and um, we're, it's a really interesting study. We're, incredibly delighted that they are have committed to doing this and that they're here to educate us about it. And then uh, both KT and Sylvia will respond, um, particularly KT will look at the um, implication of um, workers, um, penalties workers may receive for taking leave, and then um, Sylvia will talk about the public health issues. So I'll first turn it to Ruth and Eileen for their presentation, and then at the end we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers. Even though we're both here, I'm actually going to do the presentation and then um, Eileen can answer questions so I, but <laughs> you'll hear from her too, I promise you. So um, just to keep things. And how much time are we supposed to spend here? You have, um, I think, 15 minutes. I think oh, 15 minutes? 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Okay. I'll, I do time. talk fast, so, <laughs> so does she. So uh, we'll try our best. Um, well, so as Ian said, we, uh, well, I just have to say something. The two people most responsible for the existence of this program are in the room with us today, and they are Nancy Firestein, who you've already heard mentioned, and Tom Rankin, who at the time was the president of the California Labor Federation, and for reasons best known to him, was deeply committed to this issue and had a lot of political leverage at the time 
in Sacramento, and I don't think we'd be sitting here today talking about this if it weren't for those two people, so I just wanted to say that because it's great that they're here. Um, at the time, I was a, a bureaucrat myself working at the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, the counterpart to the one here in Berkeley down at UCLA. Well, actually, it was a different configuration at the time, but never mind. And so this was very much on my radar, partly because I saw Tom all the time. I knew about Nancy, and you know, and it was a labor issue, which is sort of my stock and trade. I'm also, you know, a lifelong feminist, et cetera, so I care about this issue deeply. I'm a single mom, blah, blah, blah. So for all those reasons, this was, you know, this sort of grabbed me. I was very, very busy at the time, however. <laughs> and, but it seemed like this amazing window of opportunity for a researcher because this law was passed in the fall of 2002, and the implementation would begin roughly a year and a half later in Ju July 1st of 2004. So here was this, like, window where you could, like, gather baseline data and with the hope, as Ann said, of coming back and finding out what difference it made. And so that's basically what we did. I was able to persuade Eileen to help me. I actually didn't really want to do this myself. I tried to find somebody else to just do it, and I couldn't. <laughs> I failed, and so then I thought, well, we'll do it together. So that's what happened. I'm not going to talk about the 2004 data. We are working, we're just beginning work now on a, a short book that will be the before and after comparison. So what I'm going to tell you today is just what we learned from the more recent um, research about, which was done basically a year ago in year six, as, as Anne mentioned. Um, I guess I'll go through this overview of the program just in case there's anyone in the room who isn't already familiar with it. I know many of you are. And I'm just going to share you a few, with you a few highlights. Are there copies of the thing here somewhere? Yeah, um, they're in the back table. Oh, on the back. So t help yourself to the um, report that we put out, which has a lot more detail than I'll have time to share with you today. But I'll just touch on some highlights on the, the impact of this program on business, the benefits to working families, um, a surprisingly and wonderfully um, interesting piece of data on increasing use by men. And then this is the less happy news about the limited awareness of the program and the inequalities related to that and related to that future challenges. So that's the plan. So as I already mentioned, this thing began um, in July 2004. And here's what it offers um, covered workers, which is pretty much everybody in the private sector in the state. Six weeks of wage replacement for either bonding with a new baby or caring for a seriously ill family member, well, certain particular family members, which is actually an issue. That's not everybody. Um, if you qualify, you get up to 55% of your earnings with a maximum of about $1,000 a week at the moment. Um, it's an indexed number, so that will rise with inflation. Um, it's gender neutral. Fathers and mothers are eligible. I don't have it on the slide, but domestic partners are eligible. Uh, um, adopted and foster children can be the uh, uh, recipients of the baby bonding leaves, et cetera. Um, whoops, wrong button. Um, it is a kind of insurance model. Um, in some, in New Jersey, it's actually, which has the only other state that actually has a functioning program of this type, it's actually called insurance. It's not called that in California, but it basically is. So the, if you think about like what it's like to have car insurance where you pay for this, actually it's a lot more expensive than family leave insurance, but, <laughs> but um, you pay for it on a regular basis hopefully, and then if you ever are un so unfortunate as to need it and have some kind of event that qualifies, you get money. Well, this is like that. Um, in that you're, if you're employed and it's being deducted from your paycheck, you're paying for it all the time. And then should you become a parent or um, find yourself caring for a seriously ill family member, you can draw on this. The difference with car insurance is that the drawing on it does not cause the premiums to increase. <laughs> and it's very, very cheap, but for an, any individual. Um, we don't know exactly how cheap because it is combined with another program that's been around much longer called state disability insurance, which covers, which has existed since the 1940s and, and um, began to be used for pregnancy leaves starting in the 1970s. And that is a much more, and, and those leaves can be much longer and so on. So that is clearly a, the bulk of this 1.1% tax, but we don't really know the breakdown. We tried to get that information and failed. I don't think they know themselves. But anyway, it's, it's very inexpensive. Um, the big deal about this and why I got so keenly interested in it at the time when it first became law in 2002 is that it offers um, nearly universal coverage. Those of you who are familiar with the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, which was passed, you know, 10 years earlier, um, probably know that it only covers about half of the workforce, plus it's unpaid leave. So for low-wage workers, um, it's not that helpful. Whereas this program is, you know, has the potential to really change that. I mean, that was what was so revolutionary about it, in that it covers, you know, your Walmart worker, your um, restaurant worker, somebody who makes re relatively little money and whose employer does not provide these kinds of benefits. Many employers, as we know, um, don't even provide paid sick leave, much less paid family leave. So 
before this law be, you know, existed, um, many professionals, managers, also unionized workers in many cases, had access to benefits like this or even better ones, but then there were all these other people who had nothing. And so this was like, what was really, is still really exciting about this, this law. Um, like many uh, proposals of this type, when this first was proposed, it encountered a lot of opposition from the California Chamber of Commerce and other organized business groups. You've heard all this language about many other topics more recently, so I don't really need to rehearse this in detail. It was called the job killer, um, and the business lobby did succeed in changing the law from the original proposal, which was for 12 weeks rather than six weeks of wage replacement. And um, originally the proposal was for cost sharing for, um, between employers and workers. In the end, it was, it's paid entirely um, with a payroll tax, although as Eileen will be glad to elaborate if anyone wants to hear the whole story on this, uh, it really probably doesn't matter. And, and certainly, well, that's, she feels very strongly about that. So whatever. <laughs> anyway, that's how it is. Um, so what were the business fears they, and arguments? They claimed um, that it would be really expensive for employers to cover the work done by people who are out on leave. Um, and they also worried about potential abuse of the program by, you know, illegitimate claimants. Um, and they claimed that the burden would be, you've heard this all before on the other topics, right? Would be especially um, difficult for, for small businesses. Well, this is Berkeley, so I'm going to tell my little joke about this, which is this, that I feel that if you try to pass a law in, not just in California, anywhere in the United States these days, saying that employees should have the right to breathe while they work. The Chamber of <laughs> Commerce would, man, man, would man a campaign and say that was a job killer, you know. So that, this is pretty standard behavior for, well, anyway, the good news is we did our little surveys of, we did two surveys, one in, back in 2004, which I, you know, when the law didn't exist, and then last year of California businesses, and also including some nonprofits, and asked them, okay, so what difference has this made? for your operations, and um, basically we can show you that the fears that were expressed or the arguments that were made at the time were not really um, well-founded. We asked these employers, what was the impact of paid family leave on your productivity? The vast majority said it had either no effect or a positive effect. By the way, the breakout is, the vast majority of this is no effect. Not that many said positive, but still, it's, anyway, no impact. Ditto for profitability, even a higher number. Um, turnover. Now, this is relevant because um, actually having leave available should reduce turnover, which turnover is very costly to employers, whether they're aware of it or not. Um, so again, didn't have much effect on that, but if it did, it was a positive effect. And morale, basically everybody agreed if it had any effect, it was positive. So, so that's um, one thing. Now, on the small business question, I don't know if you can see this, especially in the back, but Basically, insofar as there were negative effects reported, they were more from the large employers. So this allegation that small businesses are the ones who are going to experience problems is not um, confirmed by our survey. And, but this may be an artifact of ideology. In other words, when you call a small business, you're getting somebody who's on the ground, like actually dealing with the business. When you call a big company, you're getting some spokesperson who's got that ideology about, you know, so that may be all this is. We don't really know. But, I mean, it's, this is what they told us, though. So, but in any case, there's no evidence that small businesses are feeling it more or whatever. Um, some employers experience savings as a result of this program's existence. Um, we asked them that. Did you save money or did it cost you money that paid family leave? So 87% said no cost increases, 9% reported cost savings, but we believe the number that save money is much greater, and here's why. We asked a question, do you coordinate your own benefits with the paid family leave program? So what that means is, if you are, you know, a kind of good employer, quote unquote, that is if you provide things like paid, sick, paid vacation, paid sick days, maybe even paid maternity leave or paternity leave or whatever for your employees, um, and what you can do now is you have your folks sign up for the state benefit and then you top it off. So before you might be paying 100% of their pay for six weeks, now you're paying 45%. That's a real savings. So 60% of them indicated that they did that kind of coordination for exempt workers. That means exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act and almost as many for non-exempt. So probably a lot more than 9%, whether they understood it that way or not, actually saved money. Um, 
there were a minority that reported extra costs involving hiring replacement workers, training them, and so on. And there are certainly some industries where this is unavoidable. If you're running a hospital site, you can't just like let the work sit for six weeks, whatever, <laughs> right? Or, or a factory assembly line or something like that. But it's actually relatively few businesses that that's true of. There definitely are some, though, and we presumably that's what these 13% are. Um, about abuse, we did ask them, did they have any knowledge of abuse over the six years the program had existed? 91% had no knowledge of abuse. The other 9%, it was usually one person. So again, um, the allegations were not uh, borne out. Um, we've also done a bunch of field work, much more unsystematic than the survey, which was a stratified sample by size with, you know, basically a representative survey of California businesses. In the field work, we just basically went wherever we could get ourselves in the door, which is difficult with businesses these days, especially if you're from, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> so here's what we figured out from those field work visits where we interviewed HR managers and various other kinds of managers who had dealt with leaves and a variety of businesses. Um, if you just think about this, any of you who have ever helped manage an organization, this is obvious once you think about it, which is that every organization has to have some kind of plan in place for an unexpected long-term absence of one of their employees, right? People die. They quit suddenly. They, you know, have a heart attack. Things happen, right? And so you always have something in place, like you're, you know what you're going to do if, if that occurs. And so this is one more such possible event. But it's not like some revolutionary change in what the challenges that organizations face or that employers face. They basically have to deal with this stuff anyway. So this just adds you know, marginally to the frequency with which that occurs. And so that became really clear as we did our interviews in the field. In most cases, and this is true in both the survey data and the field work, people have coworkers cover the work while somebody's out. Now again, you can't do that everywhere. But in most, you know, especially in an office setting, that's the typical strategy. Um, and the other thing that we found, you know, very strong evidence for in the field work is that having any kind of leave policy, because many employers do have their own, is very good for both retention and morale. Now, not all employers want to retain folks. This, maybe we could talk about this later. <laughs> that, so that is an issue. I mean, some employers like high turnover, but the, the ones who um, feel otherwise, th this is very helpful to them. So we conclude from all this, as I've already basically said, that the opposition of business to this kind of program is more ideological than practical in nature. It's not really rational behavior. They, they have, um, the, basically this program was a non-event for most employers. It didn't really make much difference at all in their day-to-day -day operations. Um, and in some cases, they actually benefited. But they still, they're just allergic to any kind of government mandates or regulation. And so you will get opposition. I mean, this is kind of saying this in California is maybe less relevant because we already have a program, although it could use some improvements, in, which we'll talk about. Um, in other parts of the country where this doesn't even exist, we hope that our data will help overcome the um, inevitable opposition you know, from organized business. But anyway, so moving on. Um, how am I doing on time? Is somebody tracking it? Okay. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what we found about the benefits of the program for working people, which of course is who it was meant to benefit. So we looked at um, wage replacement rates for, so okay, I should explain. The second survey we did was not of businesses but of individuals, but it wasn't just like random individuals. To get into the survey, um, you had to be employed or have been employed in recently, and we were doing this in the middle of the recession, which was not, which is a problem actually for the before and after thing, but anyway. Um, and you had to have had a qualifying event um, in the recent past. In other words, you had to have either become a parent or had a seriously ill family member. So the survey center called people up and asked them first those questions. You know, have, have you become a parent in the last four years? Was it four years? I think so. Um, have you had a seriously ill family member um, in that period? And were you employed in that period? And if they said yes to that, then they would be interviewed. So this is not a you know, random sample of Californians or anything, but it's the group we wanted to hear about. So within that group, um, all these folks had some kind of event that could have precipitated a leave, and we compared those who used the paid family leave program and those who didn't, and that's what I'm about to tell you about. So wage replacement rates were significantly higher for um, those who used the program among all leave takers. Is this making sense? Um, and that was especially true for low-wage workers. So just as the program was intended, um, it did fulfill that promise for those who used it. Um, people who used it were also able to take longer leaves, and they were more satisfied with the length of those leaves, which was longer, um, than those who didn't use PFL. So again, we're comparing 
people who used the program to other people who went on leave and either had employer benefits or had no benefits um, during that period. They were also, the people who used the state program were more likely to return to the same employer, to the same job than those who didn't. Um, and unsurprisingly, various other benefits, like it was easier for them to care for their kids or ill family members. Nothing surprising there, but we thought we should document it. So 98% you know, said, yes, it was easier to find childcare because I had leave, you know, obviously. So, <laughs> okay. Um, we had an N of 500 for those of you interested in such things for that survey. Um, this graph is just, you know, a little slice of what we found, which shows that, oh, I should explain. So we, we were interested in, especially low-wage workers, as I said before, we'd sort of divided our data set into two big groups. What we call high-quality jobs are jobs that pay $20 an hour and have health insurance, $20 or more, and the others are, we call them low-quality jobs. So here and in the next slide, too, the data are sort of broken out that way. Um, interestingly, the people who have high-quality jobs and didn't use paid family leave have the highest um, retention rate, but that's probably because their employers have really, really good uh, leave benefits. Um, for people in low-quality jobs, using um, paid family leave does increase the likelihood of returning to the same job. So that's the right-hand side of the graph. All this is in the report for um, those of you who want to know all the details. Um, this is this is for Sylvia, <laughs> that's done a lot of research on breastfeeding. Um, we did include some questions on this. I don't, and we knew that it would have a positive effect. I don't think I was anyway stunned by the extent of that positive effect. So the weeks that um, new mothers breastfed double with use of paid family leave for both people in high quality jobs and low quality jobs. That's a pretty, pretty uh, strong finding. Um, and clearly there must be many other positive health effects which we weren't able to document. Um, okay, this next slide is um, not our data, but it's from the um, Employment Development Department of the great state of California, which collects data on, in a limited way, on the people who take up the program. And what we see here is that the use of the program by men has really grown for um, bonding claims, they call them, that means a new baby, taking care of a new baby, bonding with the baby, um, in, this, in the short life of the program, from 17% to 26% in only six years. That's pretty impressive. It's flat for caring claims, which are actually more used by men in the first place. Sort of makes sense. Since they're not. But anyway, that's um, another nice positive effect. But now I do want to say a little bit about the less happy news, which is um, that awareness of the existence of this thing remains rather limited. Um, so now remember that we've done earlier surveys, although we haven't done it for a while. We were just talking this morning about how we should do this again. Um, Several years in a running, we did little surveys of just the California adult population. Are you, are you aware of the existence of this program and so on? And, in the, and the last one was in 2007, and the figure we came up with was about 29% of all Californians knew this thing existed. They're all for it, by the way. We also asked that, like, what do you think about paid family leave? Everybody supports it. But only a third knew that they had it, not even a third. Now, in this survey just that I'm telling you about today, it's different. It's not all adult Californians. It's people who had an eligible event. So you'd expect the awareness to be greater. And indeed, it is. But we don't know how much of that reflects general awareness being greater and how much of it is just because they needed it and they were more likely to hear about it. Anyway, less than half, just less, 49% were aware of PFL in this survey. Now, notice that um, more were aware of state disability insurance. Um, and FMLA. But the gap is pretty narrow. In, those, in the general surveys that have been done of FMLA, typically 60% know about it. So, and that's been around for many years. It's a, an SDI too. It's about 60% in the population as a whole. So you're never going to get to 100% awareness, but we should be able to do better than this. Um, now, the really bad news here is that the people who need this program the most are the least likely to be aware of it. So that's what this graph shows. So Latino workers, immigrants, who are not identical groups, but obviously overlap quite a bit, and low-wage workers are far less likely to be aware of the existence of the program. And we've seen this consistently in all the different surveys that have been done on this question of awareness. So this is just the, you know, the screening survey version of that data. But this pattern is very persistent. And, and it, you know, it sort of makes sense given what we know about the world. But it's very, this is the big challenge that lies ahead. So this program is great for those who know about it and use it. That's what we see. The business fears are unfounded. But the, uh, we, we have this major challenge of getting the word out. Um, now, we have kind of sketchy data here on 
why there, there was a group in our sample of 500 in the screening survey who were aware of this, who were aware that the program existed but didn't use it, and so we were interested in learning why. And so, keep in mind this is a this is sort of not a very representative sample, but and they could tell more than one reason. But still, this gives us some suggestive ideas about why they're not using it. And I know KT is doing more re work on this in the near future, so we're going to learn more soon about this. One concern was that the benefit level was too was too low. Now. For the United States, this is like a great program, 55% wage replacement, and the level, the, the cap is very high. Like in New York, it's, it's like a fifth as much or something, but, but um, it's still not enough for everybody, and so that was one issue um, that many people cited. And by the way, that benefit is taxable, which was not anticipated by the um, craft, our, our friends here who helped uh, frame this legislation. Um, and in fact, the EDD fought that with the IRS, but they lost, so, so it's even less than 55% in effect. Um, quite a few feared some kind of negative repercussions on the job, however. 31%, um, no, this is our language in the survey, you know, feared their employer might be unhappy. Another 29, now these could overlap, these could be the same people, they can give multiple reasons. 29% said it would, they feared it would hurt their prospects for job advancement. 24%, one in four, feared that they would actually be fired um, if they took paid family leave, according to this, you know, in this group. Um, and then a smaller group thought it was, quote, too much hassle to apply. Well, that presumably is not the low-age group that I'm particularly urging you to think about. But anyway, that's what we know about that. So we, um, the obvious conclusion is outreach is really the key thing at this stage in the game, um, especially to these groups that are very needy of the program and not, and not aware of it. And we think that there are lots of, I know NETSI's group is beginning to do this, um, to reach out to community groups, also health care providers. You know, this is a point of contact with everybody who has a baby, sees a doctor at some point, maybe not as much as we would like. Every obstetrician's office should have this brochure, every clinic, that's what we think. WIC agencies, Women, Infants, and Children program should help distribute this information. It would be great if these were mandatory distribution things, but any way that anybody can think of to make this stuff happen would be good. The level of wage replacement should be higher. You know, you talk about these, this stuff in the United States and. A, people don't know about it, B, they're impressed. You go to any other country in the world, practically, and it's like, what are you so excited about? Six, you know, we in France, we've had whatever, I don't remember the details, but you know, a, a much more, much more extensive program for decades and decades. So, but, so we need to um, get a world-class program in this country, too. Um, now, this is another thing I didn't mention yet, but this is really important. Some, many workers have um, job protection when they go on leave under other legislation, but this law does not provide job protection. So if you work for a small company or have not been there very long or there are various circumstances under which there is no job protection built into the paid family leave program and so that is a problem. And that stuff about fearing employer retaliation obviously is partly driven by that. Although even people who have job protection are concerned that taking a leave could hurt them on the job. So it's not limited to that group. Um, now here's another thing. I mentioned that it's basically universal coverage in the private sector, and the only exception to that would be um, self-employed people, and they can opt in if they want to, if they know about it and go through the paperwork. The public sector, except in cases where unions collectively bargain to be part of it, is not covered by the law, and I, I, maybe you guys could tell us more about this. I assume that was because the assumption was that most public sector workers already had a, as good a benefit or better, is that right? Okay, well, uh, but. It's covered people who are covered by state disability most public sector Right. Workers. Except for staff members of the University of California, <laughs> which I will. Several of us some, in the room. Some, no. Some, you said some unions have bargained in for right. it. Uh, they can, they're eligible for it, but it depends on a board meeting. Either a union sponsored uh, negotiation situation or a board meeting. But why weren't they in the legislation to begin with? Was it because you know, the. Because you'd have to include them in the SDI of the same I see. State of okay. All right. In any case, we thought, even that wasn't what you thought, we thought <laughs> that they probably already had as good a benefit as this in some other form of makers. Well, that turns out to be what you said. It's, it's not true. And so in our, we did, the screening survey did include public sector workers, and it was clear that many of them would have been much better off if they had, had access to this. So that was, that's another recommendation we would like to offer. So that's it. And um, thank, thank you. you.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ruth and Eileen. This is, this is such an important study, and we really appreciate you not only um, doing it, but coming out here and explaining it. I'm going to turn next to KT Albuston, who, as I said, is going to talk about some of the worker penalty issues that Ruth began to surface. Um, and then we'll turn to Sylvia. I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, so the next person has a PowerPoint, so I just want Maybe you can just do it. Sorry. I'm the Luddite. I have no PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. So um, first of all, I just want to congratulate both of you on a terrific report and point out the really useful aspect of the information that we have here. For one thing, I think as Ruth's conversation uh, made clear there's been a lot of debate about what would really happen if this law was enacted and not a lot of facts. And so now we have facts. And the facts are very encouraging that it has been relatively uh, easy for employers to implement, that the use of leave is going up, especially among fathers, which is very encouraging and uh, uh, is fairly unusual, even uh, in terms of cross-national comparisons and that there's tremendous benefit to families as a result of this, both in terms of being able to take care of um, family members and the, the increase in breastfeeding. So I start with that positive because what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is speaks to this one small part of the report that Ruth ended up with, which is why are some people not using leave? Um, and in addressing this question, I'm going to talk about a couple studies that I've done, one which is the older study that's in my book, and a second one which I've just uh, finished collecting the data for that has to do with bias against mothers and caretakers. Um, and what I want to talk about is how both of these areas of research suggest that social institutions in the workplace and in the broader society can discourage workers from making use of leave rights in very subtle but powerful ways. And I want to talk about a couple fairly modest reforms that might mitigate these effects. All right. So. Um, the first study grew out of some research um, more generally in the law and society area that looks at not what the statute says, but what actually happens on the ground. And law and society scholars have long believed that the statute is the beginning point rather than the ending point of the effect that law will have on society, that rights do not uh, uh, enter a vacuum but interact with other normative systems in particular social contexts and that they're not self-enforcing. They generally have to be claimed or mobilized by the people who hold them. A lot of different factors can affect that process of mobilization including obvious things like questions of information that Ruth talked about. Do you even know that you have rights to leave? Um, also resources. Do you have the money to consult a lawyer or find someone to help you claim your rights? Uh, but also increasingly, law and society scholars have been interested in this question of social meaning, how the act of claiming rights will be perceived by those around you and what it might mean um, in the social context in which you operate. So um, rather than accepting that legislative change like the Family Medical Leave Act or this paid family leave statute in California automatically means social change, law and society scholars will ask, how does the social context shape the meaning of these rights and uh, constrain or enable workers' choices about making use of them. Um, and one might expect that alternative norms would be particularly salient in this situation where the statute is challenging long-standing beliefs about work and family and the division between the two. All right, so let me talk just a little bit about the research from my recent book. In that context, um, the, well, there's several chapters in it, but in one of the chapters, I report data from workers who negotiated contested leaves in the workplace. So these are people who had trouble taking leaves. They're the people that probably are represented in the, in the data that, that Ruth identified. Um, and what the data, the data come from interviews with these workers that investigated what their experiences were, the choices they made, and especially their subjective state of mind in terms of thinking about uh, whether or not to claim their rights. Um, some of the factors that shape their decisions about rights mobilizations are one that we would expect. Information was key. The workers that I talked to um, stated very clearly that accurate information about rights was key to feeling like they could negotiate with their employer. Sorry. This is, this is our reality in this building lately. We're under construction. Um, 
What's perhaps not obvious is the primary source of information for most workers was their employer, and that creates a structural problem because employers don't have uh, much of an incentive to provide accurate information um, about rights if they believe that that means that workers are going to be out for longer. And that made it very difficult for workers to figure out what they could legitimately ask for and cause some of them uh, to choose not to ask at all. Now, California paid the California Paid Family Leave Law requires employers to provide some information about rights, but it only requires employers to provide information to new employees and to employees who request leave for uh, qualifying purposes. So to the extent that employees choose not to ask because they don't know whether they can, they're not getting in this information. Um, so I agree with Ruth's suggestion that we need to do more outreach, but we might also want to think about the circumstances under which we require employers to provide information. But quite apart from information concerns, um, the way that work operates as a social institution also discourage workers from using leave rights. And here, um, although uh, the FMLA is an enormous step forward, we shouldn't expect that uh, instantly work would be reformed to be accommodating of work and family uh, in the way that the statute requires. So, Feminists have long recognized that work standard features, 40 hours a week, full-time, year-round work, don't accommodate uh, family responsibilities or the physical realities of childbirth. Um, but I think what has been overlooked a little bit is the normative commitments to these kinds of indicia of what it means to be a good worker. And those normative, normative indicia of what it means to be a good worker remain even after the statute says legally you're entitled to take time off. So workers who claim leave rights are challenging these normative systems of meaning about what it means to be a good worker, and they remain embedded within them. So those normative um, commitments can end up displacing leave rights in very subtle ways. And so let me give you a couple examples. So the respondents in, in my study who took leave for family-related reasons had very different experiences requesting leave or trying to negotiate leave depending on their gender. Women generally had no trouble going out on leave. They had difficulty coming back. So they found that taking leave signaled that they were no longer committed to their job. Um, they often, if they were able to come back, found that they had a reduced schedule, um, even though they didn't want one necessarily, or that they were demoted to uh, a position that was less privileged. Um, some of them discovered that their supervisors, while they were on leave, especially if they were having children, were saying things like, oh, she doesn't really need her job, you know, her husband is a doctor and she's probably going to just quit her job and go home, she's not going to stay in the workplace. And even though they knew they had the right to sue, um, if they were fired for this reason, they were anxious about what that would signal to future employees if they lost their job. Um, so I had one uh, respondent who decided rather than claim her rights under these circumstances that she would just quit and because she didn't want conflict with her employer, uh, she told that employer that she was quitting because she couldn't find childcare, which then of course confirms the stereotype that she was fighting against. Even women who initially tried to claim their rights also faced some difficulties from friends and family who suggested, well, you shouldn't claim your rights, you should stay home with your kids. So the normative conflict between what it means to be a good worker and what it means to be a good mother uh, was problematic for a lot of these workers when they were thinking about claiming rights. Men, on the other hand, am I running out of time? Oh, okay, <laughs> everybody's writing notes, so I'm worried. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so men, on the other hand, face a different problem. They had difficulty taking leave in the first place. So there was a lot of expectations in uh, the workplaces of the workers that I talked to that, they, that men should not spend time away from work to care for others, that if they took leave, that they, took, they should take their leave um, at, at, at the shortest period of time possible, uh, keep leave use to a minimum, and uh, there was a sort of hostility to the idea that men would take leave at all after a baby was born. And one respondent put it this way, hey, the attitude was, you didn't have a baby, so let's not go crazy here. But women in the same workplace weren't subject to the same expectations. So what these leave rights meant for these workers depended very much on their gender. It wasn't um, a, a clear entitlement that applied the same across the board, and their experiences deciding whether to negotiate rights or not uh, were enmeshed in an entirely different set of normative concerns about what it meant to be a good parent and to be a good worker given their gender. All right, so now I want to back out and talk about a, a more recent study uh, that speaks to this concern uh, that workers in, in the report that we're talking about today um, indicated that, that they were concerned about retaliation and negative outcomes if they were to take leave. And most research suggests that they're right to be concerned. 
So there's been a number of recent empirical studies that have clearly demonstrated a caretaker penalty. So taking leave is associated with lower salaries, less likelihood of promotion, lower, lower performance evaluations for both men and women. Um, now, although both men and women are penalized, other experimental research indicates that penalties are associated with behaviors that violate gender roles. So, in studies that hold constant uh, worker characteristics like productivity and qualifications, leave takers are penalized not only in terms of pay and promotion, but also in terms of perceptions of their personal characteristics. So, one set of penalties uh, attaches to mothers who work. So working women who become mothers are perceived to be warmer but less competent. Working fathers, father, working men who become fathers are perceived to be warmer but maintain their competence ratings. Uh, working mothers receive less pay, are less likely to be promoted, and are held to higher performance standards. The same is not true for working fathers. Um, and in some experimental field research, uh, when resumes were set out that were identical for childless women and mothers, childless women received two times as many callbacks as uh, women with children. There was no difference uh, for fathers and men without children. In addition to these penalties, there's a second set of penalties that attach to workers who are caretakers. So both men and women who provide care are seen as less committed and successful workers in these studies. But interestingly, men who take leave are perceived as less committed and less likely to succeed in work even compared to women who take leave. They're also expected to be uh, less helpful co-workers, less likely to show up on time, less likely to work overtime in these studies. So the evaluation bias seems to attach to people who violate the family wage ideal. So it's those that violate gendered expectations, mothers who work, fathers who take leave who are especially penalized. Okay, so I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna say a couple more things about theoretically why this is and what law might do about it. So there is a theory called status characteristics theory that suggests that descriptive stereotypes are operating here. So we think that mothers and caregivers in general are not interested in advancement, are likely to be more committed to their families than their jobs, and that is consistent with the empirical findings that I just described to you. In addition, there is a theory called normative discrimination theory that suggests that actors also provide, per, apply prescriptive stereotypes. And prescriptive stereotypes are stereotypes about what mothers and fathers should do. So mothers are expected to be warm, nurturing, put family first. Obviously, this is incompatible with the ideal worker standard that I described before. Fathers are expected to be the breadwinner, to work hard, be stable, responsible, and put work first, and this is consistent with ideal worker standards. Generally speaking, uh, social psychological studies show that when individuals comply with prescriptive stereotypes, we like them. We find them warm and likable. When they violate prescriptive stereotypes, we don't like them. We find them less warm and less likable. And of course, this becomes uh, a set of incentives to comply with gendered behavior in the workplace and at home. So a colleague of mine, Shelley Carell, at Stanford and I decided to test whether law could have an effect on these. Ugh, and so I have about two minutes to tell you what we found. <laughs> the theory was that law can affect not only people's uh, decisions about behavior, um, like paying people less or demoting them, but also their normative evaluations about um, uh, caretakers to the extent that law prohibited discrimination against caretakers. In an empirical study where we compared leave takers to other workers uh, within gender, we had one condition in which uh, uh, subjects evaluated employees at a company that had no policy with regard to leave, and we had another condition in which subjects evaluated uh, employees in a company that had a Family and Medical Leave Act policy. So we clearly found that there was a penalty for leave takers when there was no policy present. Uh, across both genders, uh, salary increases were about $1,000 less for people who took leave. Uh, childless women were about three times as likely to be promoted as female leave takers. But in the companies that had an FMLA policy, these differences were erased. Well, that speaks to outcomes, but what about these normative evaluations? Well, once again, uh, we found that le female leave takers in particular were seen as less competent and less committed than, than uh, standard workers in the no policy condition, but in the FMLA condition, 
these differences went away. And with regard to violating uh, prescriptive stereotypes, workers who behave, who behave consistently with their gender stereotype were in fact seen as more warm and likable than other employees, so dads who didn't take leave and moms who did, and women who violated stereotypes by not taking leave uh, were seen as less likable than women who did take leave. But again, in the FMLA condition, these differences went away. So what I think this suggests in terms of, of policy reforms is that um, it's important not only to have these statutes and for workers to know about them, but also at the point that evaluations take place, it's important that evaluators know that the statutes protect the behavior uh, that might otherwise affect both perceptions of workers and the rewards they, that they receive. And this is a very small change, but this study suggests that it could make an enormous difference in terms of outcomes for workers. All right, sorry I went over. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Great. Well, that, it's very illuminating. I'm going to talk a little bit about all the places you can find this great research. Sylvia Gundelman from our School of Public Health is going to um, complete our presentation here. Um, if I can help her do that, one second. She has a cool PowerPoint here. Here we go. Let's see here. <laughs> Oh, slideshow, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see how good I am at this from the beginning. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So um, great to be in such a great team of multidisciplinary approaches, sociology, economics, uh, law. It's all coming together. And now I think we're going to complete the circle with the public health perspective. And I want to start out by commending um, both Ruth and Eileen for really giving us uh, an overview of a well-rounded attempt to not only sort of look at these leave issues from the standpoint of market or labor force conditions and what it means for workers and employers or what it means from a gender perspective, but also by including breastfeeding to try and look at some of the health issues which are really important. So the two authors really uh, talk about how paid family leave seems to pay off, uh, particularly in, in this case for bonding, which is what I want to talk about, and uh, the health for um, mothers and infants who deliver babies. Um, and um, they talk about the, the, this incredible increase that they noticed in the duration of breastfeeding, particularly among women with high paying jobs. Uh, but I want to bring your attention to the fact that uh, paid family leave is really, really important, but it's all happening in the postpartum. And in fact, I think uh, new or emerging research and work that um, my team has been doing here at Berkeley School of Public Health would suggest that leave that is taken routinely before uh, birth is also something that needs to be considered and given more attention because of its favorable uh, positive benefits for the health of both the mother and the infants. Um, I know and uh, that for a long time, we feminists were not putting much attention into this, thinking that we had to protect the equal pay and equal rights for women. And it's like the woman's biology kind of disappeared, right? But the woman on the pedestal needs to be brought back because more and more we know that what happens to the fetus, what happens to the intrauterine environment is going to have consequences over the adult period, over the life course of a person's trajectory. So it's really important to consider that. So for instance, evidence from Canada and one study uh, done in, in Montreal suggests that it, women who, and again in 
Canada, particularly Quebec, which is a very progressive uh, province in Canada, where women on average uh, take eight weeks of antenatal leave, suggested that for one extra week of leave, women had far less obstetric complications at the time of labor and delivery. And this among women who delivered term. We're not talking about women who were at high risk in pregnancy. Um, in our study of uh, working women in Southern California done um, uh, recently, we found that women who took uh, antenatal leave in the ninth month of pregnancy had a fourfold, that means 400% reduced odds of delivering uh, uh, with a primary uh, C-section. By primary C-section, meaning that you are having a first-time C-section, not a repeat C-section that often has to happen as a result of having had one in the past. So again, some potential pathways for why maybe um, um, there might be a reduction in C-section has to do with the fact that you know labor and delivery is hard work. And if you're working very, very hard and you come to the del delivery room feeling very fatigued, very stressed, very run down, you're going to be likely to just feel like, oh, I can't progress in labor. I can't do it. I don't have the stamina. And you're also probably going to be sort of put in a situation where you're likely to want more analgesic because you can't stand the pain. So this is all very costly to our healthcare sink uh, system. Antenatal leave, that is leave taken prior to delivery, has also been linked to favorable outcomes for the infant at birth. It decreases odds of preterm delivery. Other studies have found uh, decreases in perinatal mortality and low birth weight. Uh, this I'm referring to large ecological studies uh, done mainly in Europe. And they show that leave, if, if leave is paid, this is where you see most of the significant differences. In our study, again, of working women in Southern California, we were finding that uh, for women who were in very high uh, strain jobs, um, taking maternity leave prior to delivery really prolonged their um, gestation. And again, you might be wondering, well, why is that so important? It's important because in the last few weeks of gestation is when the brain of the baby matures and grows enormously. So if you can retain your baby in your tummy, in utero, for even a few days, the difference counts when it comes to brain uh, maturity. So. I guess now we're going to talk about the postpartum, which is where family, paid family leave comes in. And paid family leave uh, is really important. In the case of California, usually these 12 weeks that Ruth and Eileen referred to in women who are eligible for uh, state disability insurance, usually it means that they have an opportunity to take leave above and beyond those six weeks that SDI provides if you deliver vaginally and up to eight weeks if you've had a C-section. So what do we know? What does research inform us about the benefits uh, of uh, postpartum leave on maternal physical health? Well, some evidence suggests that leaves of at least 12 weeks, okay, so at least the minimum of what SDI could pay or uh, offer and the lovely sort of um, advantage of um, SDI is that it does keep uh, job protection unlike the paid family leave is my understanding. No? No. Okay, no job protection. But 12 weeks of at least up to 55% pay is a big deal because it increases maternal vitality. Other studies have suggested that maybe your self-perception of your own health is also more positive. 
um, our studies on breastfeeding as well as that of other uh, researchers doing um, studies of postpartum leave do suggest that women who take leave are much more likely to initiate breastfeeding, that is put the baby to the breast. In our study, we found that they were also two to three times more likely to establish breastfeeding, that is to give themselves at least those 30 days to really not only say, oh, I tried it and that's it, that's initiation, but it takes time for you and your baby and your nipples and your sore uh, body to get adjusted to that breastfeeding initiation and more so if you need to pump the milk. So um, those things are very important. And of course, like Ruth and Eileen, we found that uh, taking uh, postpartum leave does increase the overall duration. And that's really important for women's health because uh, it has many benefits for the health of women, uh, including, for instance, uh, associations with reduced risk for breast cancer. Um, it's not only that there's a wealth of advantages of breastfeeding for the infant who's consuming that milk. But again, evidence on maternal physical health is sparse, and we need a lot more research in this area. There's also evidence um, suggesting that postpartum leave has maternal mental health benefits, uh, as demonstrated by shorter um, as well as longer term depressive symptom reductions, reductions in anxiety symptomatology, elevated maternal responsiveness, sensitivity to the infant's cues, and um, that it has been linked to decreased uh, marital dissatisfaction. It also improves child health. Again, leaves longer than 12 weeks, uh, and this is where the evidence is much stronger than for women. It improves um, the uh, physiological and emo emotional regulation in the infant. The idea of the, the fact that if the mother is around, particularly in the first three months, there's gonna be more ability for the infant to be aroused and calm down and for the infant to learn how to regulate its own arousal system. Um, and it's been associated in one study with fewer externalizing, acting out behaviors, temper tantrums at age one. Um, it's also associated with a more timely number of well baby checkups, a complete, uh, more likelihood of a completed immunization schedules. Um, breastfeeding for the infant, of course, and decreases in infant mortality, particularly as we see in Europe with paid um, leave. For the fathers, the impact on health um, is not something that I think we have been demonstrating. So there's lots of room here for more uh, work in this area. But we know that it does promote uh, bonding with the infant, and this has important consequences for uh, how um, attachment between the father and the infant progresses, and that it improves gender equity, which has been discussed at length by um, the other presenters. So evidence is limited, and it beckons more. So let me end by just saying, okay, what would be optimal re leave arrangements? Um, I think we really don't know what is the optimal length of leave for family health. And that there might be a lot of cultural and structural variations if we compare it by country. So different states here, different Countries will have different policies and different norms and different expectations, both in the labor market, self-expectations, and so forth. So it's really important, I think, for us to consider that question. What would be the optimal length of leave? And it might be very different, again, if you're looking at it from a health perspective, sociological, or economic perspective. But health-wise, there seems to be quite a nice body, increasing body of research suggesting that maternity leave starting prior to delivery can improve health outcomes and reduce medical costs. 
We also know from a health standpoint that full recovery from birth for a mother can take up to six months or longer, depending on where she starts out after in pregnancy and after delivery, and that it is influenced by maternal health and maternal, her own care behaviors. It's influenced by the infant's health and uh, health care demands and behaviors. It's influenced by the partner's support, as well as the community and the policies that are in place that can support uh, both mothers, infants, and families, men. So although it's hard to disentangle these effects, the effects of each one of these actors, it's clear that research evidence suggests that paid leave has positive effect on health outcomes. And no wonder that more needs to be done to promote uptake of parental leave in California and elsewhere in the country. In our study of working women in Southern California, despite California having this um, state disability insurance program that allows women to take up to four weeks of uh, paid leave uh, prior to delivery, only 32% um, of the women in our study, only one out of three were taking leave. Clearly, we do not have a culture of leave. And um, again, when it comes to postpartum leave, we know, for instance, from our study, that about 1% of women will take only two days of postpartum leave. Most take longer than two days or even a week. But what we're trying to say uh, from a health perspective is that 12 weeks is right now what seems to be sort of a minimum good cutoff point for healthier or for a likelihood of healthier health outcomes. And we are finding that the norm in the U.S is that women uh, return by two to three months postpartum, no more than what is guaranteed by the Paid Family Leave Act, and that perhaps a little more would be beneficial. And finally, let me end by saying that work um, in countries such as Sweden, the Nordic countries, where they have much more um, sort of experience now by providing um, leave for men as well, would suggest that we might want to start thinking about sort of the importance of men and women taking leave during this whole sort of um, postpartum period, but at different times. That if women can take leave so that they can promote breastfeeding in the earlier part of the postpartum period, like in the first six months of life, and men can take leave later, that just beginning to think about those arrangements can really provide that gender balance that would be favorable from a health standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, right. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you to everyone um, for participating. Katie, can I borrow your book for a second? Your book. I always want, I, this is such an amazing group. I need to do a little promo and all the amazing things that we have here. So if you'll bear with me, all of these things are available to you. Uh, Leaves That Pay is the report that Ruth and Eileen did. I think all of you have a copy of it. If you don't, please grab it on the way out. Um, in addition, the Labor Project for Working Families and Berkeley Chefs put out a guide to implementing paid family leave um, for other states, lessons from California. So one of the reasons we did this is that President Obama has made a commitment to try to um, encourage Congress to put forward money so other states can initiate paid family leave. So I urge you to take a look at this. I want to introduce a really important person in our audience who hasn't been introduced yet, Jillian Lester. Can you please stand up so everybody knows who you are? Jillian Lester is a professor of law here at UC Berkeley. She wrote a very important article um, several years ago called In, uh, In Defense or a Defense, a Defense of Paid Family Leave. 
Um, she worked with another uh, professor here, Steve Sugarman, and me and a team at Berkeley Chefs and a team at Georgetown University Law School where we put together something called Family Security Insurance. It builds on and cites all of the people <laughs> in this room as, men, as well as many others and really does a thorough review of what the research says and tries to answer some of the questions Sylvia just outlined, which is how long should we have leave? What should the wage replacement be? What would it look like if we had a national system of paid family leave in our country? Please be sure to take a copy of this on your way out. I'm going to, in a second, call on uh, Netsy and Brandy to talk about what's happening here in California. Together with a number of people in this room and others, we met um, as academics and advocates and came together to look at where are the weaknesses in California. So just recently, we completed a, a paper um, called Reforming Family and Medical Leave Laws, Promoting Health and Economic Security for California's Working Families. California is further along than many states, but we have a long way to go, so grab a copy of that one. Um, and then, um, of course, Katie's book is for sale on Amazon.com, and I encourage you to take a look at Institutional Inequality and the Mobilization of the Family and Medical Leave Act. So with that, um, I want to open it to questions, but I first want to call on Brandy, um, who is with the Labor Project for Working Families and who can give us just a little window into what's happening here in California um, on these issues. So Brandy, why don't you go first, and then we'll go ahead and open it to questions. Phyllis, can you pass Brandy the microphone? Or Freda? Sorry. Thanks, Anne. Can you, can you am stand I on? up? Stand am up. I on? Yes, okay. you're on. Um, thanks so much. I actually wanted to thank everybody um, who spoke today because your research is so critical to what we're doing in the legislature this year in California and probably for years to come. Um, and in fact, this year we have the bills that we are working on that address every single one of the issues that you talked about. Um, Ruth and Eileen, your research has been so critical for us this year in California, trying to make changes to the paid family leave program and even incidentally trying to make changes to our California California Family Rights Act. Um, and we have two bills, um, AB 59 and AB 804, that would expand family leave to other family members. So siblings, grandparents, grandchildren, adult children, and parents-in-law to make them both eligible to take job-protected leave under the California Family Rights Act and to participate in the paid family leave program. Um, we are also working on a bill, SB 299, which uh, really addresses the antenatal leave. Um, and what we're trying to do with that bill is to protect health insurance coverage uh, during the pregnancy leave period, because right now, you're as a pregnant woman on pregnancy disability leave, your health insurance coverage could be terminated. Um, and then finally, KT enforcement is sort of something that we are looking at in the long term. In the short term this year, we are supporting a bill that would protect people from having their leave rights interfered with, so to strengthen enforcement in that area. So I just wanted to mention all of those bills. These are just one part of a broader effort to improve these laws, and Anne, you mentioned the white paper has a broader set of recommendations for what we hope to do over the next five years. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Brandy. Well, we have an incredibly sophisticated audience here, so I'd like to turn it um, to questions from the audience. Um, it may be that we'll answer them, but there may be people in the audience who can answer them just as well. So who has a question? Ifat. Ifat is a student who is from Israel. She's an LLM student and has been working on these issues in her home country and here studying for the past year. Thank you. Um, so coming from Israel, I feel that I feel uncomfortable. We do have paid um, family leave. Uh, it's not like we've reached equality, so we have still much work to do, and, and I'm inspired by the work that has been done here. But my question is, um, this is something that I'm struggling with the day after, and especially for fathers. So my imagination and my idea, the way I see it and the way I fear that is, is being done is, that, all right, we gave you leave, so now you work for that. In terms of the structure of the workplace, in terms of the uh, crazy hours that some uh, people do, especially lawyers, uh, but not, not only. So um, the, the, the leave is something that will cure everything, and I'm, I'm afraid of the, the, the other side of that. So we gave you leave, now you work for us for the rest of your life, and you'll pay it back, even in an implicit way. Not, of course. Um, so I don't know if the leave will change the atmosphere, maybe, or just um, harm those who actually take it in terms of how much they need to work afterwards. 
So I think that goes directly to some of the points that KT brought up in terms of the worker penalties. I may call on her first, and then maybe Ruth and Eileen have something to add. Well, it's an interesting question. Is this, is this on? Yeah. So uh, in the in 1990, um, now I've, I think it's Hunt and Hunt published a book chapter that said that uh, family or gender neutral family leave would result in the penalties no longer being gendered and just being applied to those who take leave, and that was the concern, right? And and then there's this other concern, which is that of course, um, after you have the child, you have 18 years of care to provide for them, and the leave doesn't really take care of that. And Vicki Schultz has made a proposal that that rather than focusing on uh, event specific or gender specific accommodations, what we need to do is restructure the workplace entirely, maybe reduce the number of hours that constitute full-time, um, change expectations about uh, the relationship between work and non-work life. And I think that, that the, the promising aspect of that is many of the gendered norms that I described are not sort of free-floating in the world, they're also built into our institutionalized structures. So changing those structures can also change those norms. Um, that said, in the middle of a recession, it's hard to imagine, of course. But I do think that um, some of the, the evidence from this report is quite promising. We're seeing more men taking up paid family leave, which uh, seems to run counter to the idea that, that men are gonna choose not to do this or that there's not gonna be um, more use of these kinds of, of uh, benefits. So that, that I thought was one of the most encouraging things out of this report. And although your trend is much stronger than the international trends, there is a sort of slow trend upward in other countries and take up. And some of that does have to do with the structure. But I think you raise an important point that, that uh, family leave does not solve the long-term question of the gen general relationship between time away from work and time in work. Right, so I, I would just add that uh, certainly in many of the European countries where they've had the leave policies much longer than we have and much more generous than we have, uh, they have definitely moved in the direction of uh, what in the Netherlands is called uh, the right to request, uh, where you can request either more or fewer hours on your job. And if we're talking about Germany or the Netherlands or Belgium, the onus is on the employer to demonstrate that they cannot grant that request without causing great harm to themselves. Uh, so uh, in the Netherlands where, it, in fact, this law is very much uh, used, I happen to have been there in 2000 when it was about to be implemented, and uh, they actually had tax incentives for the early implementers. The companies that implemented before the law required them to got various kinds of incentives, tax incentives, so that their experiences could be used to inform other employers about how best to do this. So we could learn something, some would not do it well, but it would be a learning experience and so on. And you may know that the Netherlands is the country with the uh, highest proportion of men in part-time work because you, you don't have to give up your job. You don't give up a full-time job and take a rotten part-time job. You keep the same job. You request fewer hours. In some cases, it can't be granted. It would be too onerous for the business, but in other cases, it can. Uh, then they, in the UK, they uh, introduced something that we called soft touch right to request. You had the right to request, and the employer had the right to refuse. So, <laughs> so you know, as an American, I said, well, this will never work. This is ridiculous. I'm not in favor of it. This is terrible. And it had some other things, because it was not, gen it was not gender neutral. Or it, 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 men could use a boat. It could only be used for care of a young child up to the age of five or seven. I forget what, the, what it was. Uh, and so it was related to child care, which I thought was a terrible idea as well. I still think it's a terrible idea. But uh, come to find out that, so, so what the law required is you have the right to request, they have the right to refuse. However, they have to give you a written reason why they refuse. So your request has to be taken seriously and they cannot discriminate against you in promotion or advancement or anything else for having asked. They can refuse, but they can't, they can't retaliate. Uh, and uh, some work that has been done by Ariana Hegovich and others at uh, IWPR uh, actually shows that, uh, well, the Netherlands is an exception, but if, if we look at Germany, which has the same law as the Netherlands, uh, if you compare the UK and Germany, many, many more people request in the UK. So the rate of approval is higher in Germany because the employer has to show they can't do it, but many, many more people get a reduced schedule or a schedule more to their liking in the UK. 
And even if the employer does not completely agree, what often happens is that it leads to a negotiation in the UK now, so that the employee may not get everything they ask for, but they get a better schedule than they had. And it has to do with number of hours and which hours you work. So I think you're right. I mean, if we're going to think about how to change the workplace, uh, I think that part of the work and family agenda has to be not only paid family leave, not only paid sick days, but also uh, much greater worker input and control over number of hours and work schedules without sacrificing uh, wages without sacrificing advancement. Great, thank you. Other questions? Netsi, and then Tom. Um, a then. lot of the discussion was... Oh, can you speak? We're recording oh, this. If you can speak into the... Um, a lot of the discussion, I think we focused on um, parental leave. So I wondered if any of you want to just comment on caregiving. And I know in California, the vast majority of people who take at least the paid family leave are, are doing it for um, you know, parental leave. And so just any comments that you have on the caregiving part of it. Um, Ruth or Arlene, do you want to go first? And then I can add to that. Or do you want me to go first? Um, why don't you go first? Okay. So uh, recently I did a report uh, that was specifically looking at, at Alzheimer's. It was with uh, Maria Shriver and it was looking at the impact of Alzheimer's on our workplace and particularly looking at the millions of people who are providing care to a relative with Alzheimer's or a relative who has dementia. Um, it's a growing um, issue in our country for a couple of reasons, which is one, that, they're, um, that people are living longer, and as a result, there are just more, um, there are more elderly people, in addition to the fact, we, of course, we have the baby boom. With living longer, uh, diseases that come with old age, like Alzheimer's and dementia, are increasing, and it's having an impact um, not on, only on the people who are getting these diseases, but it's having an impact largely on their ch adult children, people who are in between kind of 45 to 65. Um, we have done not very much to prepare for it, I would say, in two ways, which is one, some of the, th the things that we find when we did a, a, a survey on this issue, we found that 40% of people who reported that they were providing Alzheimer's care were providing it for somebody who was not covered under the FMLA, meaning that it wasn't their parent or their spouse. It may have been their grandparent, it may have been one of their in-laws, it may have been an aunt or an uncle but it wasn't covered under the leave laws. So this is obviously troubling, and this is why Brandy mentioned the expansion of some of the leave laws to uh, expanded family members would make a difference. Um, so I think that's you know certainly one issue. But the other issue is the issue that Ruth and Eileen highlighted, which is that it's not just, and I don't know, I'd be curious to know if you, if you, if you asked a second question, I don't know if you did or not, but so we have the general problem of lack of awareness. Only 49% of the people who had some life event knew about this. I don't know if there's a difference between people who had babies and people who were um, caring for a sick family member. I bet if, there, if you did do it, it would be a differential. Was that something you asked? We asked them, we didn't ask that, or we could analyze those two groups, but what we did ask was if they knew, if they were aware of the law, we then had some follow-up questions. You know, did they know it could be used by fathers? Did they know it could be used by caregivers? And th those numbers were lower than the general awareness, but they were not as low as we feared. I mean, right. Yeah. So I think the, the kind of overall message is that there's a lot of work to do to prepare in this issue. Our, our laws need to change because many of them, while they do account for seriously ill family members, they don't necessarily take into account some of these unique issues as to elder care, which is much more unpredictable than having a baby, as we know, um, and often comes uh, unpredictably and you know, you're not certain how long it will last. Alzheimer's, um, people, uh, people with Alzheimer's often live on average about seven years, so this is a long-term issue. Um, so, you know, I think as Ruth said, there's a general problem about awareness and then um, potentially a slightly greater problem with regard to people being aware that they could actually use this program for some of their um, elder care issues. Yes, KT. So, so one interesting thing, uh, comparatively speaking, is that, that although we lag behind on uh, uh, family leave around uh, new children compared to other countries, we're actually fairly far ahead in terms of providing uh, care for sick family members, um, in part because many European countries have a maternal estate, so they're very much focused on um, uh, supporting uh, maternal welfare and that kind of thing. The flip side of that, though, is that, uh, and, and this is something that the center is very interested in, the integration of leave with general state-provided um, social welfare benefits is, is uh, different in 
Europe than it is here in the sense that there's a lot more supports for caring for ill family members and providing medical care in Europe than there are in this country. And so the fact that we provide this leave isn't necessarily all that progressive because it essentially privatizes the costs into individual families in this country, costs that otherwise would have been at least partially borne um, by the state in, in uh, uh, comparable countries like the ones we're talking about here. Yeah, I think KT raises a really important issue. One of the issues that Jillian Lester and I talk a lot about and have worked on is the issue of labor attachment. How do we make sure that you get the support you need, but that you don't drop out of the labor force, which obviously has serious economic impacts on your immediate family income, but long-term economic impacts in terms of retirement. So one of the things that is important is not only um, uh, not only paid leave for you to take time off, but also um, support uh, government support for paid caregivers. And one of the things that we certainly are seeing in this budget crisis, uh, many people know that here in California, the program called the In-Home Support Services, which actually um, has uh, Medicaid funding to provide paid caregivers to low-income family members for an ill or elderly uh, family member, uh, is being significantly cut. And so this has an implication uh, not only on those who are receiving those benefits, but it has an implication on their relatives who are in the labor force and will uh, be impacted if those services are cut back. And I think we need to do more in terms of educating the public about the interaction uh, between these laws. Um, other questions or thoughts? Uh, oh, wait, Tom and then Carol. Uh, Ruth alluded to the uh, provision in the paid family leave bill where we had to uh, give up on the employer contribution or to get the bill through. And uh, she mentioned Eileen uh, yes. would have something to say on that, and I'd like to hear what she had to say. Yes. It's, a, right. it's a huge uh, problem whenever I speak to people, because if you say it's shared between the employer and the employee, it looks like that's fair. But just think about this for a moment. Uh, you've negotiated contracts that have included health insurance. Who actually paid for that health insurance? If you look at who wrote the check, the employer wrote the check. But when you bargained it, the employer said, we have here a compensation package. You can tell us, do you want it in wages or do you don't want it in health care? And to get it in health care, you took the lower wages. So you, the workers, paid for that health care. They could have insisted on higher wages and no health care. The employer wouldn't have paid it and they wouldn't have had it. They had it because they took the lower wages. They paid for it. And that's what happens with anything. Economists say there's a difference between who the law says pays it and who the tax actually falls on. And these taxes, uh, it will depend on how skilled the worker is and so on. There's, it's a little more complicated than I'm making it seem. But for the workers that we care about, the employers can shift it to the employee, except that they are absolutely at the minimum wage. That's the only time it can't be shifted. But except for the minimum wage workers, any worker that we care about, you know, if you're a football star, and we raise your property taxes, we raise your whatever. You're, you're, a, you're a Silicon Valley engineer and you're being moved from Texas to, to Silicon Valley and the taxes are much higher in California than they are in Texas. The employer will give you enough income to make up for it. So it looks like you paid the tax as the employee, but the employer really paid it. Okay, so for the really high school people, put the tax on whoever you want, the employer pays it. But for the rest of us, put the tax on whoever you want and the worker pays it. So I would never go to the mat for it. 12 weeks of employee paid. That's what I want. Uh, in California, where employees pay the whole, the whole freight on both the TDI or SDI, as you call it here, you have the most generous benefits. In New Jersey, we split it on the, uh, the disability insurance and the workers pay the family leave. We're, right, we're halfway between you and the bottom, OK? New York, where it's completely 100% employee paid, it's less than $150 a week at the maximum. So if the employers pay it, the, the benefits are terrible. If the employees pay it, the benefits are great. <laughs> Why don't we want these things if we can afford them? Things that are not, I, I, we can't pay for public education by workers paying for it, okay? But we can pay these things. I, I, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm just beginning to think about it. But you know, we have two. We, Michigan has already cut your regular unemployment compensation from 26 to 20 weeks. Florida is considering cutting it from 26 to 20. And if unemployment is a 5%, just 12 weeks of unemployment insurance. Are we going to leave it in the hands of the employer if this is what's going to happen? So I haven't come to my conclusion yet. But I'm going to take a look and see. Maybe we, you know, where, if I ask you where are the unemployment benefits the most generous, you're going to tell me Norway, Sweden, the Nordic countries, 100% employee paid. So we got to rethink this. What looks like is fair might not make any sense for workers. 
Thank you, Eileen. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it, I just I love this panel that we have an economist, a sociologist, a lawyer, and a, a public health expert, uh, which is wonderful to have everybody's expertise. I'm going to take two questions, one from Carol and one from Jillian, um, and then we're going to wrap up. I'm going to go a couple extra minutes late just because we, we ran a bit over. Feel free to um, leave if you need to, but it, it's a good conversation, so I don't want to cut it off uh, short. So Carol. OK. Um, the research on TANF recipients who have maxed their benefits or come to their two-year benefits shows that even in good economies, they're extremely vulnerable. Their hours get cut, they get moved to non-child friendly, on and on and on. Given all that, how does this interact with the really vulnerable population who are probably the ones who need this the most? So I've done a little work on this. Shall I try to answer that question? So one of the interesting things is that we often think of uh, paid family leave and TANF as two separate pieces. And one of the reasons we do that is that um, under paid family leave, there are uh, labor force attachment requirements. In California, they're relatively minimum, uh, minimal. Um, some of us believe that the labor force attachments should be greater so that you can encourage labor force attachment. Um, the TANF program is really built on a system of social welfare in which we, um, um, it, you know, as we know, prior to 1996, there was um, an encouragement to uh, stay out of the labor force, particularly when a baby is born, uh, for some time. Obviously, now there's greater work requirements, and, and people are encouraged to go back to work uh, more quickly. Um, but one of the interesting things that, um, surprisingly, Wisconsin, before the days of um, Governor Walker, um, has done is to start educating low-wage workers about the ability to actually take TANA as a form of paid family leave. So in states where there are not paid family leave, making sure that you educate people that they actually could qualify for TANF. And so that what they were finding is that they shifted their framework in educating that population. They began to see a greater take up of people who had never previously been on welfare went on it uh, for short periods of time during times in which they were out of the workforce for a uh, baby, and then they went back to the labor force. So in some sense, it was uh, exactly as the name suggests, temporary assistance for needy families. It was a, it's a form of paid family leave. Netsy and I have been talking about how in California we could do a better job of helping people who are kind of coming in the front door to our agencies, understanding, you know, what, what, should you be applying for TANF or paid family leave, uh, unemployment insurance, various uh, ways. And I think there's a lot more thinking that could be done in that, in that way um, and a lot more integration between these populations. Any other thoughts? Okay. So Jillian. So I'll, I'll, is this, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'll try to be quick about this because I realized people, I didn't realize what time it was when I put my hand up. Um, other research that I've been doing uh, in a, sort of another intellectual space uh, has, uh, has had me thinking recently about um, the virtues of targeting benefits versus providing them across um, socioeconomic groups in the population. And, um, you know, there's, there's gonna be an effort with, uh, if Obama funds uh, these kinds of efforts to try to think about paid family leave models in other states. And I'm especially interested um, in, uh, I, I think Ruth and Eileen, you might have thought about this since your project is so closely focused on the issues of the lowest income workers. So I'm wondering if you have um, an opinion on w whether for other states, a better model might be one that targets benefits at low income workers rather than uh, you know, having a program that seems to cross lots of socioeconomic boundaries, but functionally it, it's, um, it's, it's higher income workers who are, are, are taking up the benefits? I, I think the problem with targeting is that first you target, then it becomes a welfare program, then they get rid of it. So I'm opposed to uh, excluding the wealthy from social security benefits. They pay in, they should take out, we all benefit. Uh, what Wisconsin, uh, sorry, what Washington State, which did not have already a temporary disability insurance program did, uh, since they had to implement it from the, from scratch, and you have to into, uh, implement these things sometimes, to, you want to keep the cost down and so on. Is they did a flat across the board, so if you had a if you had an incident that you needed it, everybody got the same whatever it was going to be three hundred dollars a week, which is very beneficial for low income. Uh, in in uh, New Jersey, uh, the benefit is two thirds of your weekly pay. 
but the cap is between, it's like 550, I forget the exact amount, but it's, right, it's not nearly as generous. So California is much more generous at the top end. It's only 55%, so if you're a minimum wage worker trying to live on 55% of what you got, got before is not that great, right? Uh, but at the top end, it's more generous. In New Jersey, the bottom end is more generous. You get two-thirds of your weekly pay, uh, but the maximum is less. So uh, I would not go to target it. There are other ways to think about how you're going to uh, make sure that, it's, that, that people who need it the most uh, you know, get, get something that's, that's meaningful to them. Yeah, and I think it ties back to the, the previous question that Carol asked, which is how do we think about the interaction between these programs? And I think we, we haven't done enough of that to really think about where, where it's needed. Um, I realize, Brandy, you had your hand up. Was there one last question you wanted to ask before I call it to a close? Yes, of course. So, um, Ruth, um, our paid family leave bills have gone unopposed um, in the past by the chamber, which is a, a good thing. and is and opposed this year, um, and um, uh, and I and we are sort of pushing the strength of your study. But we got a lot of pushback from the chamber on our family leave bill, saying you absolutely cannot talk about that study because this is not a paid family leave um, change. This is a California Family Rights Act change. Um, and I wondered if, when you were interviewing employers in the employer survey, um, if the sort of the overlap between the two came up, and if that might be one of the reasons why by the larger employers who are FMLA covered um, might have had more negative responses than the smaller employers who are not FMLA covered and are only PFL covered. So just trying to want, sort of figure out like what is our response to, to the chamber in terms of trying to talk about this study because it's so tied up and workers' experiences with, the, with, the, with access to FMLA and CIFRA. We didn't really ask them about CIFRA, but so two things. One is, um, well, we saw in the field work lots of confusion, and frankly, I've experienced it myself. It's just really hard to keep straight all oh, this. I mean, you say this in your report, too. There's like 6,000 different rules and regulations. It's, I can't keep them all in my head. I have to look it up every time, you know. Like to, so they're right about that. I actually think there should be one law that, like, sort of covers it all, you know, like one-stop shopping for family law issues. But the way we know how, why it isn't like that, right? Um, I, I don't really quite see the logic of their argument, though, in that what we're saying is this stuff doesn't really impact businesses in any significant way, period, right? So, well, but anyway, we didn't ask that question in particular. I don't, do you want to add no, this no, at all? I don't. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think they're just looking for something, to, well, well, some I, way I, to demolish the. Well, I think there is a real issue for employers, right, which is that under, you know, under this California paid family leave, there is no job protection, so it, they don't necessarily have to, but many are covered. So expanding the coverage population could mean greater take up for this. I don't know, it's just one possibility. But I wanna end on a positive note, so I will do that, <laughs> which is that um, I was recently speaking, I shared this with Nancy this morning, I was speaking at a um, meeting last week um, in San Francisco of a number of corporate leaders who were interested in these issues and particularly were interested in, in some of the elder care issues. And I, a man raised his hand who was a vice president of a, ma of a very major uh, corporation, which I won't name because he hasn't given me permission to do that yet. Um, um, but he raised his hand and I thought, oh no, he's going to, you know, uh, ding me on something. And he said, you know, I don't think we've done enough to educate people about how um, important California paid family leave is. And then he went on to tell me that he had a, a, a spouse who had a hip replacement surgery, and so he ended up taking intermittent um, California paid family leave to supplement um, his income when he had days off in which he was providing care, and he went on and on about how we need to make sure that employers understand that this is a really important benefit to their employees. So I think that one of the things that was really striking to me in that conversation was that it was HR professionals mostly at major corporations, is that as people have their own individual experiences in the workplace, it influences how they think about their employees employees, how they think about their organization, and frankly, the workplace culture is beginning to change, and I think that there is opportunities, particularly with this study, um, in which we see that employers are not only saying this isn't harmful, some are saying this is in fact quite helpful, 
uh, there are opportunities, I think, to continue to uh, build on it. So I thank all of you for this really robust conversation today, and I particularly thank Ruth and Eileen for traveling all the way out here, and Katie and Sylvia for participating and, and sharing their rich research as well. So thanks to everybody. Thank you.